<clears throat> well, John Fowler was going to um, do ki- doing his kiss talk, and John and Lara, they having uh, Lara's mother Diane's 80th birthday over the, this weekend. He gave me that idea. Hopefully, I uh, <laughs> I did it well for the kids' talk this morning. Transfiguration, transfiguration. Today, here we stand between two Christian liturgical seasons. Behind us is a season called Epiphany. Epiphany, time period in which Jesus revealed God's glory and His own power. Now, ahead of us is, we know, the season of Lent, L-E-N-T. Lent, period in which we seek to penetrate the mystery of suffering and love and salvation. So now, between these two seasons, today we have the festival of transfiguration. Transfiguration, which are at the same time both a great mystery and a great revelation. Transfiguration is one of the strangest stories um, from the gospel. Well, not much information is provided, not much about uh, what happened, not much about why it happened. And while the transfiguration is a sin, a miracle of Jesus, It is unique in a sense, unique that this miracle happened to himself, happened to Jesus himself. And if you think about other miracles, he was performing for other people, providing miracle on behalf of others, such as feeding the 5,000. And it is also strange that just after, just after today's reading in verse 9, it says, Don't tell anyone what you have seen. Do not tell anyone. Jesus is telling disciples not to tell anyone about what they had seen. This transfiguration, it marks a transition point, transitional point in the journey of faith for his disciples. Although not all the disciples, they were present at that event They are all changed by this encounter. They are changed by this incident. By this change, they have a new direction. They have a new vocation. Up to this point, Jesus has been pointing them, telling to to disciples about his passion, about death. He was outlining their call to be cross-bearers. And it is after this mountaintop incident. It is after this transfiguration incident that Jesus is more obviously turns his face to Jerusalem, and his teachings become more persistent and focused. After transfiguration incident, there is a marked change, significant change in the way of their journey on which Jesus and disciples are engaged together. So now Jesus took with him Peter, John, and James. They went up on the mountain to pray. Right before they went up to the, to the mountain, right before this passage today, they were talking about who Jesus was. They were talking about who Jesus was. Jesus asked disciples, who do the crowds say I am? Who do, the, who do the people say I am? Some people thought He was John the Baptist. Some people thought he's Elijah or one of the prophets risen from the dead. And Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter responded right away, you are the Messiah of God. You are the Messiah of God. Instead of saying you have a good answer, Jesus tells them again not to share the information with anybody. Because, because things were going to be very difficult, very soon, not just for him, but all for his disciples and followers. Peter and others, they are not too keen. They're not too keen on those words of Jesus about suffering, about death. After all, they are understandably hoping for deliverance from their enemies, deliverance from the oppressed 
oppressors, the Roman Empire. They are longing for the taste of victory, taste of liberation, not the death and suffering. So that six days after this, this difficult conversation, six days after that Jesus goes up to the mountain, and today's reading starts from there. Today, Peter, James, and John get taste of glory. They get to have one of those aesthetic visions that might have trans transformed their lives there. I mean, Disney movie, I'm um, in Lion King. You may remember this character, I'm um, Timon and Pumbaa. Um, these are little other animals. They took little uh, Simba when he uh, went away and they had a journey with Simba, the Lion King. And they were shocked. They are shocked to learn that this baby lion, Simba, they have been raising is actually the king of the pride land. In a semi similar way, Peter, James, and John, they would have been very shocked to see Jesus transform into this true glory in front of them. Now, Peter just awakened from sleep. He was offering to prop tent so they could preserve the experience. But he did not, do, did not know what he was saying. Well, we are sure. We know that he was only trying to be helpful. And I think this is a reminder that sometimes all we need to do, what all we need to do is simply be still, simply listen. Be still and listen. We, are, we sometimes think that, that every situation requires us to do something. When we hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. It sounds like that God is speaking to Peter that, Peter, you may remain silent and listen to him. In the midst of teaching and healing, Jesus had called his followers to stop and pray. Stop and pray to be open and strengthened by God's unexpected and indescribable grace. Where well, we know that with our own ability, we have a limit. We know that when we only rely on, our, rely on our own knowledge and experience, we will soon be tired and we will find that there might be something missing. So if you want this kind of supernatural transfiguration experience, first thing we should do, first thing you should do, is to pray to God. Pray to God. And that is what Jesus did in the midst of busy schedule of his ministry. If you want to be transformed into the likeness of God, likeness of our God, first thing you should do is to pray to God. At this transfiguration, we are told that his clothes became dazzling white. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with him. So why with Moses and Elijah? Why? This suggests that Jesus took his place in the company of the lawgiver, the Moses, and the renowned, most renowned uh, prophet, Elijah. Then why? Why does this experience become so important? Because it, this experience is pointing both to the past and the future. Past and the future. Jewish people believe that Elijah would return to Herod, come with coming Messiah. So his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration was his witnessing. That witnessing that his Jesus was indeed the Messiah they were waiting. In that sense, transfiguration point to the past in figures of Moses and Elijah. And it also points future, future to the resurrection of glory of Jesus as a sign of hope to the disciples, a sign of hope. Hope of resurrection is at the center of Christian life. That is center of our belief. Th through the witnessing, through witnessing this transfiguration, 
disciples had ultimate vision of the future that leading them into mission field. This hope of resurrection that they saw through transfiguration takes those ordinary people, just like you and me, they became the founder of Jesus' movement. They saw with their eyes that their teachers, Jesus, their teacher Jesus indeed had a power to transform himself, power to trans transform them, and power to transform the world. And when we follow him, we can also bring God's transformation. You and I can bring that God's transformation into the world with him. So we believe that same power, same power can still change us. This same spirit of transformation can still touch our lives, can touch someone else's lives and bring healing and reconciliation. So on this morning of transfiguration, we give thanks to God that we are called to share that power, called to share that spirit of that transformation in this world as the first disciples were called. Here we are on the near edges, very close to the season of Lent as we set out with Jesus towards Jerusalem and towards Mount of Calvary. As we sincerely pray to God and listen to his still speaking voice, we hope and pray that we may become the agent of God. You and I still become agent of God who brings his power and spirit of transformation. God's power is overwhelming even for Jesus' close disciples like Peter. Both command to take up the cross and the experience of encounter with God. They can be frightening. But the listening to God promises a transformed life. It may not be an easy one. We know that. But God does not leave us alone with our fear. God promises to remain with us. For Peter, James, and John, who shared that moment with Jesus, there surely could be no turning back for them. There's no turning back. Their journey of faith was emboldened. It was renewed. So as we prepare to leave this season of epiphany behind, we carry us with with us, all the new and enlightening discoveries of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And we embark on the season of Lent, reflecting on all that has been revealed. We are eager to discover more and emboldened to journey on in faith. We pray that we can touch our world by bringing God transformation with his Son, with that hope. With that vocation, we journey with Jesus of Nazareth. My sisters and brothers in Christ, a road to Jerusalem is now before us. Amen.